Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the book of Revelation. Uh, if you're following along in order, Dalton just wrapped up chapters 14, 15, and 16, the bowls of wrath. And in this session and for the next several sessions, we're going to do a pretty deep dive into chapter 17, 18, and the first actually several verses of chapter 19. We're going to look at the longest prophecy in the New Testament. We're now coming up on some of the final chapters in the book of Revelation, and in fact, some of the final chapters, some of the consummate concluding chapters in the entire Bible. Uh, this is an incredibly important but wildly uh, under-discussed prophecy in the body of Christ. I mean, it's discussed in the prophecy world. But in terms of sort of mainstream Christian preaching, you'll almost never hear anyone talk about these chapters. And yet, as I said, it's a very important prophecy. Now, before we jump in, I want to call your attention to a conference that we're putting together this summer, July 2023, July 13th, 14th, and 15th in Dallas, Texas. We're calling our friends and family from all over the world. If you're able to make it, we would love to see you there. Uh, for more information, go to maranathasummit.com. Okay, so the way that I'm going to approach or introduce this prophecy, as I said, we're going to do several sessions on this. We're going to touch on a lot of important related themes related to this, this prophecy, related to these chapters. Um, but to introduce it, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than I normally do. I'm just going to read through all of chapter 17, 18, 19 in this session, as I begin teasing out the meaning behind some of this incredibly apocalyptic, symbolic, mysterious language. And the reason that I, I want to do this is, one, I just, because we're doing a deep dive, I want to read through the whole text. But as we do so, unpack some of the mysterious symbolism and begin identifying some of the primary biblical criteria to understand and identify this mysterious entity, this woman, this prostitute, this queen, uh, Babylon. You know, what, what is the Bible saying about her, and, and how do these various criteria help us to understand what the Bible's talking about, right? As I said, an incredibly mysterious chapter. Uh, incredibly mysterious prophecy. So let's begin with chapter 17, 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. Okay, so one of the angels that was just involved in pouring out the bowls of wrath, he came and he spoke to me. Sometimes we just read statements like this and it's easy to miss how bizarre and profound what's being said. Like, So here's one of these powerful, divine, heavenly beings, these angels that's just that has just completed pouring out the bowls of God's wrath on the earth. And he comes over and he starts talking to me, you know. And he, what does he say? He says, come, come here. I will show you the judgment of the great harlot. So the first description of Babylon or mystery Babylon is she is called the great harlot harlot. Now, that statement is actually important. What it means is essentially she's the biggest. I mean, from a biblical perspective in terms of the language that's being used here, the point is that she's not just a harlot. She's not one of a million other prostitutes. She's the great harlot. Like, this is the big mama, so to speak, to use modern terms. Um, this is the, you know, sort of the granddaddy -o of all harlots, so to speak. And it says she sits on many waters. Now, throughout the book of Revelation, really throughout the Bible, this uh, type of language speaks of peoples. It speaks of the Gentiles. So this great harlot, this, this consummate <clears throat> prostitute, she sits on where she has tremendous influence over the peoples of the earth, over the Gentiles primarily. And it says, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immor immorality. So the, 
the powerful men of the earth, the powerful men and women of the earth, the rulers of the earth, the power brokers of the earth. So it's not just political leaders when it says the kings of the earth. You know, it's the power brokers, the powerful people of the earth. But yes, it's politicians and rulers and leaders. So the leaders of the Gentiles, primarily, again, of the earth, they committed acts of immorality with her. Now, again, um, the term immorality, you've got a few different words, and we're going to actually get into this a bit more as we move on. But you've got different words in the Greek that are used throughout the New Testament for immorality or adultery. You've got porneia. Porneia means that you committed you violated a covenant, so to speak. So a man who cheats on his wife, that's adultery, that's porneia. Then you also have general terms like mochia. Mochia is just adultery. So, you know, anyone uh, that sleeps with someone outside of marriage, that's, that's mochia. But someone who violates a covenant, it's a more specific term, and that's porneia. What it's referring to when it talks of porneia, really either way, it's essentially talking of spiritual immorality. And a lot of people really zero in on this because you have a whole segment of the body of Christ, as we'll discuss later, who wants to argue that this mysterious woman, this harlot, is Israel, or it's Jerusalem. And so one of the main arguments that they make, and again, we're going to come back to this and, and repeat this, is that this is a woman who violated a covenant she committed adultery. Therefore, it's Israel because it's Israel throughout much of the Old Testament that is viewed as being in covenant with Yahweh, with being in covenant with the Lord. And she's the one who's constantly being rebuked and chastised for engaging in immorality with the false gods of the nations, with idolatry. Now, it is using this language, but as we'll see, that does not in any way, shape, or form infer that this is speaking of Israel or Jerusalem, because it's not. I'll just sort of uh, give away the punchline before we start. It's not talking about Jerusalem. It's not talking about Israel. But what it is talking about here is the worship of any god other than the one true god of creation. That is considered spiritual immorality, okay? It's idolatry. Anytime any human whether it's Israel or a Christian or anyone who is in relationship with God or not, everyone throughout the earth has been created by one God. And any form of worship other than worshiping that one true God is idolatry. It doesn't matter if you're a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a you know, whatever, a Wiccan, you know, anyone that worships gods other than the God of the Bible, that is idolatry. It is false worship. Okay, and it's considered immorality. It uses the symbolism of cheating on a spouse, if you will, to refer to idolatry. So the kings of the earth, through their relationship with this mysterious entity, they are engaging in idolatry. They're engaging in acts of immorality. And I'll even go so far as to say this. It's more than simple worship. Okay, so let's say... Um, trying to think of an example. Let's say you had a, a wife, and she finds out that her husband, he hasn't necessarily been cheating on her, he hasn't been sleeping with another woman, but he is paying for this woman's apartment. <laughs> like, he's paying all her bills, and he's been hiding it. She goes, why have you been paying this woman's bills and taking care of her? Why have you been, you know talking to her and all. He may not necessarily be engaged in intercourse. He's not cheating on her, but that's still considered, um, it's still considered cheating, so to speak. And so, you know, when you have the kings of the earth engaged in this relationship with this woman, it's not simply worship, but that's ultimately what it's referring to. But it's any act of unfaithfulness, if you will, to the one true God of creation. And it says, and those who dwell on the earth. So the kings engage in idolatry, acts of immorality with her, but those who dwell on the earth, and this is a very common term, I know we've probably mentioned it a few times throughout the study, the earth dwellers. That's a term that's uni universally referred to, not simply those that are on the earth, but the, 
the uh, the rebellious, if you will, those who don't worship, the earth dwellers, like they're peoples of this age. So those who dwell on the earth, they were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. So what is it? What is this talking about? You have statements in the New Testament where it says, don't be drunk on wine. Rather, here's a much better alternative. Be drunk on the Holy Spirit. It's actually kind of a funny uh, statement because what happens is in the charismatic world, of which I'm part of, you'll often get people citing this that are, um, let's just say, during seasons where the Holy Spirit is really being poured out and there's a lot of manifestations, which is just quite frankly, what happens when the Holy Spirit is poured out, when weak, frail human bodies interact with the Holy Spirit in a a very powerful manifest way, oftentimes the body short circuits, and you'll see people do weird things, flopping around on the ground and this type of thing. Like, I know that's unusual if you're a Baptist, you go, yeah, that's demonic, it's all kundalini spirits or something like that, but no, the reality is when the human body comes in contact, whether it's with demonic spirits or the Spirit of God, there is actual um, physical process that takes place. Like when the power of God was released to raise Jesus' body from the dead, the earth shook. Okay, the rocks, the dirt were not overcome with emotion. So when you see someone flopping around, it's not just that they're just overcome with some charismatic religious emotion. Sometimes the body, as I said, this is the best way I can explain it, short circuits, wires and things buzz out and, you know, different manifestations happen. But in any case, so in the charismatic world, people will often quote this statement in the New Testament, don't be drunk on wine, be drunk on the Holy Spirit. And then you'll see all these, uh, again, charismatic folks like acting like they're drunk or being drunk. And you actually see examples of this in the Old Testament as if when the Holy Spirit comes, they're just... It's almost as though they're intoxicated. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's really, I mean, I'm not saying that's not God. It's really not for me to judge someone's personal experience. I think, in fact, I think at times that actually happens. But the statement in the New Testament, it's ironic because what it's saying is don't be overcome. Don't be, like, the idea is a spirit, whether it's an alcoholic spirit or a a spirit, like a, a, an entity, these things can influence our actions, our thoughts. Like when you get drunk, it changes your mindset. You have a, an altered state of consciousness, whether it's alcohol or drugs. And it's saying, don't allow your, your mind, your head space, your actions and your thoughts to be influenced by alcohol or wine Rather, be sober, be influenced by the Holy Spirit. So it's not saying, like, don't get drunk on wine, don't act like an idiot on wine, but instead act like a raving lunatic on the Holy Spirit. Because that's how, that's my point, is oftentimes you'll see charismatics read it that way, but that's not the point. The point is be sober. When the Holy Spirit comes on us, it leads us to think clearly and to and to have more of a, again, a sober fear of the Lord. So he says the peoples of the earth are overcome, their influence, their mindset, their thought process, all of these things are influenced by the immorality, by the false religion. When we say immorality, we mean idolatry, we mean false religion. The peoples of the earth are profoundly influenced by her false religion. This is so important. Verse, verses 3 through 5. And this angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. You could say a desert. In fact, I prefer the term desert. As I've said many times, when most modern, when the modern mind hears wilderness, what we think is the Northwest Territories, Alaska, Sarah Palin's backyard, the wilderness, like we think a treed, forested wilderness, this type of thing. But biblically speaking, it's a desert, okay? When it says wilderness, it means a lonely, desolate place away from cities, away from urban centers, away from people, 
places where there's nothing but just owls and jackals and, you know, this type of thing. It's a place, but it's in terms of just topographically in the Bible, whenever it says wilderness, it means the desert. So this angel carries John away in the spirit, just like he was carried away in the spirit back in uh, in chapter 4, verse 1, where he says, John, come up here. And he says, immediately, I was in the spirit. He was not in his body. He was in the spirit. By the way, let me just add this as a side note. This will upset a handful of people. But there are some in the body of Christ that teach soul sleep. They teach um, the idea that you cannot leave your body, that the soul and the spirit are one in the same. That if the spirit's detached from the body, there is no consciousness. There's no awareness. You can't have one without the other. We have numerous examples throughout the scriptures where the spirit leaves the body and sees and experiences things. And Jesus portrays and describes just such a reality with the story or the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Where in the afterlife, you have these disembodied spirits. They don't have bodies but they are conscious, they're aware, and they're even experiencing pleasure and paradise or torment in the case of the, of the rich man. So it's just an it's a unrelated, but it's a, a relevant statement to make um, that in the afterlife, separated from our body before the resurrection, when our spirits and souls are reunited with our bodies, that in that interim period, we remain conscious Again, either experiencing the pleasures and the rewards of righteousness or torment for the wicked. He carried me away in the spirit into a desert. Now, this is is a relevant part of the prophecy. It's not just a random, unrelated statement. Like, he carried me away on a high mountain and he showed me this. It's not just like, well, which movie theater did you go to? Oh, I went to the one up over off of 4th Street you know, or whatever, Quindaro Avenue or something like it. The point is not to say just this random theater that he went to see these things. He went to see the woman. The angel takes John to see the woman and she is in a desert. Okay. The desert is relevant to what he's seeing. It's not disconnected. It's not just, again, the movie theater where he sees these things. He goes, you know, he just, He took me out in the desert because he wanted to show me some things, but the desert really is irrelevant to what he was showing me. No, the desert is central. It's a very important clue. It's a very important part of the story. So he says, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So here you have this woman, again, the great harlot. So from the get-go, she is called the great prostitute. Harlot's a very, seems like kind of a Victorian term, late 1800s, the great whore. You know, some translations actually do say the great whore, but specifically she's a prostitute. And here she is, and she's sitting on the beast. She is riding the beast. Now, the point here is to communicate partnership. It's to communicate relationship. There is a symbiotic relationship in the same way that you can't think of the Lone Ranger without thinking of his horse, Silver. They are a partnership. They go together. They are one in the same. Well, they're not one in the same, but it's as though they're one in the same. They form a unit. You know, if the Lone Ranger just by himself, cowboy, I know we're going back to like the 1960s and 70s, but, you know, he's always seen with his horse. They are the a dynamic duo, so to speak. So the woman is in relationship to the Antichrist system. The beast is the coalition. It's the coalition of nations that form this last day satanic empire, this alliance, this coalition. And of course, there are times that the beast is also referred to as the individual, the Antichrist himself, that will be the primary human instrument to lead or govern uh, this coalition of nations. And then, of course, the dragon, which is Satan himself, is the puppet master behind all of it. So you've got Satan, and then you've got his human puppet, which is the Antichrist, and then he is controlling this ten-nation coalition, this empire, this revived empire. But here's this prostitute, here's this woman, And she's sitting on the beast. 
and both of them are full. They're covered with blasphemous names. This becomes very important to understand her nature. It, she represents rebellion against the one true God of the Bible. She, she represents a rejection of, a mockery of. She represents hostility towards. She is against the God of the Bible. She doesn't pretend. She doesn't come across as, oh, well, she's a faithful Jew or she's a faithful Christian. She's covered with blasphemous names. She is hostile toward the God of the Bible. And this beast, again, covered with blasphemous names, has seven heads and ten horns. Now, we've teased this out previously in Revelation chapters 12 and 13. We discussed um, the various options in terms of what this beast represents. And as many of you who track with, uh, with myself and Dalton, you know that I have a, a pretty strong opinion. I've you know, obviously written books arguing that the, the Antichrist coalition, the empire of the Antichrist, will be a Middle Eastern, North African, primarily. It's, it's revealed throughout the scriptures to be a North, um, North African, Middle Eastern, probably Islamic empire, Islamic coalition of nations, probably a revival of uh, something like the, the former Ottoman Empire. Now, to be clear, yes, I've written books about that. I'm not overly dogmatic about it. I think a very solid scriptural case can be made. I think a much better scriptural case can be made for that than anything else, than any European or Roman beast system. Um, but these are not matters of faith. You know, it's not like you have the first church of Islamic Antichrist versus the first church of European Antichrist, something like that. That's not the point. But it's as we peer into the scriptures, um, it's, it's worthwhile to discuss these things and to present our case to the body of Christ, to be Berean, so that we can be watchful. And so I want to be clear, this is not dogma, but I personally believe that the beast is a revived Middle Eastern, North African Islamic coalition of nations, something like um, a much worse version of the Ottoman Empire. It says, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. The, the, this, uh, two different colors. One represents royalty, the other represents sin. You can make a very good case that purple, um, it, it represents royalty, it represents luxury, it represents harlotry, and of course, though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them as white as wool. Scarlet oftentimes represents sin. So purple can be royalty, it can be harlotry, um, and again, scarlet, the bright red scarlet often represents sin. So there's a very interesting combination here. As we'll see, the woman is adorned, it says, with gold, precious stones, pearls, having in her hand a gold cup. So she's decked out like she's wealthy. She's portrayed as living in luxury. This theme comes up multiple times. So not only, the, here's the strange mixture, not only is she a prostitute, she's also described, portrayed as a rich queen. You know, I mean, uh, this may sound very strange, but we're just a couple months past the death of um, Queen Elizabeth. It would be very strange to think of a queen, especially one that's whatever she was in her late 80s or 90s, but to think of a queen as also being a prostitute. There's incredible shock value with this type of imagery, and that's exactly the type of shock value that the book of Revelation is intending to convey. On one hand, she comes across like she's a queen, like she's royalty, but the reality is she is a disgusting, filthy, blasphemous prostitute. And let me just say this too, I, I, I may mention this point in my book, and this may seem like a strange statement to make, there are more prostitutes, if you will, throughout the earth right now than at any time in human history. Just statistically, there are more prostitutes than at any time. 
many of them, quite frankly, are slaves. They're, they have been caught up in a world of human trafficking, um, of being abused, of being drugged and this sort of thing. And they don't want, deep down inside, and some of them overtly don't want, some of them are literally kept in cages, like millions. That's not what this is talking about. Okay, this is not just condemnation of someone who finds themselves caught in that world. This is a woman who makes the choice. She wants to be a prostitute. Like she is a vile, disgusting, blasphemous prostitute. And it's important to kind of make a distinction there. I, that may seem like a strange point to make, but I, I think it's relevant. She has in her hand a gold cup. This is grotesque. This is bizarre. So again, here's this contrast, this juxtaposition. She has this golden cup, which is something that you would usually only take out, right, for the best of company, for the most important ceremonial times or, you know, when you have really important guests, right? Like a gold cup. So what's in the gold cup? It says it's full of abominations and the filth of her prostitution the unclean things of her immorality. So, like, don't get me wrong, and I probably shouldn't yet, because the, it's intended to have shock value. It's intended to have shock value. Um, but I don't want to talk about this. But I think for anyone, the first time that you ever had sex, and you go, so what were your thoughts afterwards? One of the most common words, people go, pretty earthy. <laughs> A little more earthy than I had imagined prostitute, you know, like it's a very human process. And in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a very, let's just say earthy process. The filth of her prostitution, like this is disgusting. Like this is not something someone wants to drink. She has this golden, beautiful chalice. It looks so wonderful. It, what's inside like the most disgusting concoction you can possibly, like you can't get much worse than this, the filth of her prostitution. Listen, please hear me. This, this, is, this is the way Satan works. This is the way Satan works. Oh, look at this. It's so wonderful. He presents the things that he wants us to get involved in as a golden cup. You know, I, I um, as I've, mentioned many times, I, um, I still, to this day, I, I love uh, the band The Grateful Dead. Today, as a Christian minister, I love their music, um, but when I was a kid, I used to go to the shows. It was very different. A big part of the reason I went was for the drugs. But when you look at, in the party, you know, type of thing, when you look at a band like The Grateful Dead, they're, they're you know, this very hippie band, it's very colorful. Everything on the outside is you know, it's like almost like a circus or something. It's so, it's like, wow, you know, like this gumball or this um, everlasting gobstopper from something from Willy Wonka. Like this looks like it's the sweetest, most colorful, fun piece of candy that I could ever eat. But at the center of it, it's worms and maggots and filth and trash and junk. Satan always candy coats his poison. He always presents the things that he wants to get his hooks into us, he presents it as beautiful. Oh, it's a golden cup. Drink this. This will bless you. Like, the Lord says you can't have this. But is it really true that the Lord, you know, like, is this really hurtful to you? And inside is filth and disgusting and things that just, things that destroy the human soul. It's so important to recognize that he is the king of deception Every, all of his promises are hollow and empty, and when all is said and done, those who follow him end up in the pit with him. I have to remind myself of these things. I know that we all do. In the cup are unfathomable, disgusting filth. Now, here is a funny one. On her forehead, a name was written. It's a mystery. Babylon the Great the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. 
Now, when we talk about this woman, I wrote a whole book on this. The title of the book is Mystery Babylon. When people discuss Babylon, they often say Mystery Babylon. But here's the thing. The way the Bible presents it, it's not Mystery Babylon. He goes, on her name, a, on her forehead, a name was written. It's a mystery, colon. And then it says, this is what was written on her forehead, Babylon the Great. So he goes, this is a mystery. It's Babylon the Great. It's not Mystery Babylon. Those two words actually don't go together in, in, within the text. The woman is Babylon the Great. She's not Mystery Babylon, okay? She is this, again, end time Babylon. Uh, it's not historical Babylon. It's not the Tower of Babel, so to speak. It's a last day's entity. But it's not mis- the, the text does not call her Mystery Babylon. It just calls her Babylon. The, what is the woman? It's Babylon. So that's an important point. Now, I'll tell the story. Um, I just recently told the story of, um, where did I tell it? In, uh, in the Rapture and Endurance of the Saints series, I told the story of a dear friend of mine named Mike. He was uh, one of my closest, dearest friends growing up who uh, died shortly before I got saved. And his, his death was one of the things that the Lord used to propel me to salvation. I was supposed to be with him the night that he got killed, um, but just last minute, I mean, he was coming to pick me up, and last minute, like a couple minutes before he arrived, I blew him off, and I went to Bible study for the first time in my life. And when I was at Bible study, he got killed in a uh, really bad car accident, rolled his truck, truck rolled three or four times, and uh, and he got killed. So I have all these horrible stories growing up, guys, forgive me, but it's a good it's a good story to demonstrate what's happening here. Everyone talks about this woman, Babylon. Like it's such an incredible mystery. Like we can't figure it out. Like what is it? And there's all these books and all these debates and we're going to take some time to go through all of the primary uh, possible interpretations and su- suggestions that the body of Christ has bandied about. But here's the thing. God goes, "Okay, guys, I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. I'm going to make it real clear for you. Here's the woman, okay? What does it say on her forehead? And in big letters written across her forehead, he writes, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots and abominations of the earth. Like, he spells it out clearly. Like, there's no confusion in terms of who she is. Like, he writes it. He takes a Sharpie and writes right across her forehead. Okay, guys, I know you're slow to understand apocalyptic language and symbolism. I'm going to try to make this very clear for you. I'm going to write across her forehead, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, the the mother of all prostitutes and abominations of the earth. Now, here's the the story. So when I was a kid, um, I'm going to say we were probably sophomores, you know, in high school, and we all went to a few different high schools, even though we all lived close to each other. I mean, my neighborhood buddies, um, I went to a vocational technical high school. A lot of people don't know this. Here's some good Joel Richardson trivia. Um, I, my, the height of my education, yes, I did graduate from a, a little two-year Bible training school. Um, but before that, I barely graduated from high school, and I went to high school for welding. <laughs> I went to a vocational technical high school to learn how to become a welder, and I barely graduated. So there is uh, my education. But I was going to the Voc Tech High School. Another guy actually went to an agricultural high school. Another guy, uh, there was there was like four different high schools that we went to, but we all collaborated and we decided to skip school this day. And we were at my friend's house and we all got drunk. And uh, Mike tended to be the biggest drunk most of the time. And he passed out on the couch. And so he was passed out drunk. And so we decided to be great fun Actually, sh- I sh- it I shouldn't I may I don't know just because he because um, he's deceased, but it's such a such a great story. But anyway, um, we went into my friend's sister's room and got makeup, and we painted him up like a prostitute. You know, back in the '80s, like massive blue uh, eyeshadow or whatever you call it. You know, blush and everything, and then we took. And we, I think with mascara, we wrote on his forehead, drunk, or I am drunk. 
clear letters across his forehead. I am drunk. And then he's passed out and we wake him up. So this was all part of the plan. We wake up and we go, Mike, 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 dad, your dad called. Your dad called. He is so mad. You need to go home now. You are in big trouble. And he wakes up. He's like, oh, my dad. And so he like runs out of the house. And the way we lived is he kind of ran through the woods to his house. And he went home, walked in the house, unaware that he has makeup on his face. And because he didn't look in a mirror. And in the words, I am drunk, written in bold black letters across his forehead. And of course, his dad, we'll just say his dad gave him a whooping. What we call a whooping today versus what we called a whooping back in the 80s are very different. But, um, you know, we thought this was hilarious that Mike, Mike got beat, you know, because we, we played this prank on him. Okay, so weird story. But the point is this. When he walked in his house, his dad wasn't like, oh, you know, maybe, you know, whatever story Mike had. Oh, well, you know, I didn't skip school or this or that. You know, his dad knew what was going on. He's drunk. He doesn't even know that he's got eyeshadow and blush and the words written across his forehead that says, I'm drunk. He had no idea. His dad knew exactly what was happening. We also should pay attention to this written across our forehead. This is like the first description that the scriptures give us. Now, what does it say? Babylon the great. Now, again, it repeats this term, the great. Previously, it said the great prostitute. Now, here it says Babylon the great, and then it gives us a parallelism, okay? Parallelism means it's basically repeating the same thing using different language, and it says she is the mother of harlots. So she's the great harlot, She's the mother of harlots. She's the great Babylon, or Babylon the great. And she is the mother not only of harlots, but abominations of the earth. So let's take these three expressions, these three, again, parallelisms, and discuss what they mean. So as I said, when it says great, it means the biggest, the big mama. I mean, the biggest of all. I, I think of, see, the interpretation that's often offered is people will read this and say, she's the mother of prostitutes. This is really weird. So then they go, well, what that means is that she has given birth to a whole bunch of little prostitute children, prostitutelets, you know, or something. Like, she's a prostitute, she's the mother, and all of her daughters are prostitutes. That is not what is being said here. So those who hold that, what they'll often say, because a very common interpretation of this prophecy is that this represents the Catholic Church. So within the body of Christ, some who are, I'll say in some pretty fundamentalist extreme forms of the Hebrew Roots movement, who take this interpretation, what they'll say is they'll say, well, this represents the Catholic Church. But all of her daughters that are prostitutes, those are the other Protestant denominations. So any Protestant denomination today, you know, mainstream, Baptist, this or that, Assemblies of God, Calvary Chapel, Vineyard, whatever you name it, Presbyterians, Methodists, they're all really just watered-down Catholics until they really take on Torah and stop saying Jesus and this type of thing. They're all prostitutes. Okay, so you have the great prostitute, and all of her daughters are prostitutes. Now, again, my point here is not to get into that, but that's not what the text is saying at all. That's not what the text is saying at all. What it's saying is she is the greatest of all prostitutes. She is the big. When it says the mother of, it's not talking about she gives birth to a bunch of other prostitutes. It's saying she's the big mama. She is the big, the greatest Again, she is the great prostitute. She is the great Babylon. She is the mother of all. The mother of all is a very Middle Eastern expression. Do you remember during Gulf War I, if you've been around that long, where Saddam Hussein basically threatened George H. W. Bush, and he said, you know, if you send troops over here, it's going to be the mother of all battles. It's going to be the mother of all battles. He was not saying, okay, he was not saying, this battle is going to give a birth to a whole bunch of other little battles. He's saying this is going to be the final. This is going to be the biggest battle there's ever been. That's the point. It's the biggest. Okay, so again, what is a harlot? What is a prostitute? It's someone who worships someone other than the one true God of creation, the one true God of the Bible, Yahweh and his son. 
right? Anyone who worships or leads others to worship anyone other than the Father and the Son is engaged in harlotry, in immorality, in idolatry. This is the biggest, the greatest form of false religion that has ever been. That's what it's saying. And it also calls her Babylon. So false religion, abominations, she's the mother of them all. She is the big mama. So we're talking about false religion. This is the greatest. Again, if you just tease out the language and don't try to impose, you know, your particular view. Again, if you're coming from the Hebrew Roots Movement, the Hebrew Roots Movement, and I'm not bashing everything about the Hebrew Roots Movement, but it's defined by hostility and antagonism toward pretty much the rest of the church. It's, it's grounded in this sort of superior, like we have it all figured out, all of the churches are wrong, everyone else is corrupt and this type of thing, and we're the only ones that are following this pristine sort of version of early Christianity or, you know, the early messianic faith or this type of thing. That's these ideas, these are ideas, uh, undercurrents that dominate much of the Hebrew Roots movement. And I say this again, I speak sometimes in various Hebrew Roots um, churches or conferences, and I'm not hostile to all of it, but there are things that I'll openly criticize. And if you're part of the movement, you know what I'm saying is true, that there often is this that very much look down on any traditional denominations. They'll say, I came out of the churches uh, and this type of thing. So if that's where you're coming from, then you're going to want to try to say, no, it, it means, you know, that all the other churches are prostitutes. But that's not the language that's being used here. It's very clear what's being said. The mother of, the great, it's the biggest. And harlotry, prostitution, is idolatry. It's false worship. It's, it's really that simple. This is the greatest of all false religions. Now, let me just say this. We're going to get into this more, but of course, what is the biggest, greatest false religion that mankind has ever known? Well, you probably could say humanism today. The problem is humanism is, by definition, not a religion. It's against religion. But the reality is it really is a religion. Um, but in terms of formal religions, again, in the part of the world from which the beast will come, it's Islam. I mean, unquestionably, Islam right now, it's approaching 2 billion people. It's, re it's really just a, probably within a couple of years it will hit 2 billion Muslims globally. The Christian church is at about 2.2. We really haven't proceeded much in the past few years. Yes, the church is growing in the global south, but it's imploding in the global north or the west. Well, Islam is just steadily growing, some by birth, some by conversion, etc. But Islam is catching up. But in terms of religions other than biblical faith, there's no religion in the history of mankind numerically that has even begun to encroach upon the numbers that Islam has produced. We're going to get into this some more as we, as we move forward. Verse 6 and 7. I saw the woman drunk. She is drunk. She's intoxicated with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. So again, what's in her cup? The filth of her prostitution and the blood of the saints. That's actually what's in her cup, and that's what she's drinking. She is drinking. She's filling herself with her false religion, she is overcome, she is influenced, she is under the influence of her false religion, which leads to Christians, the witnesses of Jesus during the tribulation, shedding their blood and being killed. And she's influencing the kings of the earth and the earth dwellers likewise to drink deeply from her cup and to come under that influence, to be drunk on the blood of the saints and the witnesses of Jesus. And here's John the Apostle. Again, I think back, you know, first century. He's seeing this vision. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. He's like, what in the world am I looking at? Like, he's just, I wondered greatly. Like, he is just transfixed on this that he was just shown. Like, what in the world are we looking at here? And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you. I'll explain to you the mystery of the woman 
and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Now, this is the part that I want to sort of skip through a little bit more quickly. Um, in this session, we're really not going to have time to read through all of these chapters. We're actually going to pick it up next week. And then, as I said, we'll begin teasing it out um, a bit more. But what's interesting here is integral to understanding the identity of this woman, the angel says, I'm going to explain it to you. But for the, ne- for the rest of chapter 17, he actually doesn't talk about the woman at all. He talks about the beast that she's riding. So he goes, well, you know, why, why are you so transfixed on the woman? I, listen, I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to explain to you the mystery of the woman. And he says, and of the beast. And then he spends most of his time explaining and describing the beast. So verse 8 through 10. He says, the beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to, or will come up out of the abyss, and then go back to the abyss, will go to destruction. So this beast exists, and then it ceased to exist, and then it comes back. Now, as a result of this statement, you have, within the prophecy world, people have really, really read into this in a profound way. They'll say the Antichrist is a individual that used to be alive, and then the Lord allows somehow this sort of a loophole in the system, and he'll be resurrected and he'll come back. So you'll have people say, the Antichrist is going to be Hitler reincarnated. He comes up out of the abyss or this type of thing. And it is kind of using that language, but here's the, here's the caveat, is the beast At times, throughout the book of Revelation, as we've discussed, at times it refers to the empire, and at times it refers to the individual that will lead or govern the empire, the Antichrist himself. At times it's speaking of the coalition of nations that form this Antichrist coalition, and at times it speaks of the Antichrist. And so if this is talking about the individual coming up out of the abyss, then yes, it seems to be indicating something very unusual that a dead person comes back from the dead, that Satan somehow is able to accomplish that which God should only be able to accomplish, which is reanimating or reincarnating or resurrecting a dead individual. I don't believe Satan has that power, not to literally bring someone back from the dead. Only God has the power of life and death. Satan doesn't have the power over life and death. What is being described here is the beast coming back as if from the abyss, as if from the dead. The point is this, this empire, this coalition that suffered the fatal head wound comes back to life. We've already looked at this in previous sessions and the inhabitants of the earth say, who can make war with the beast? You know, like, whoa, the point is this empire will die, it will cease. It was and it, then it's not, but then it comes back. This empire will be revived. This coalition of nations, this kingdom will be revived. That's why I say it will most likely look like a revived Ottoman Empire, a Middle Eastern North African uh, empire that once was and then comes back. And again, you can go back to chapters uh, 12 and 13. We get into this in much more detail. But then ultimately, at the end of the story, it goes back to destruction permanently. Right? When the, Jesus returns and he brings with him his kingdom, all other kingdoms will be crushed forever. They will cease to exist. And those who dwell on the earth, again, the earth dwellers, the rebels, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Okay, So those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, they will wonder. They'll be astonished. They will, you know, their, their attention will be fixated on this beast. When they see the beast, that he comes back, that he was, and that he's not, and that he comes back. Now here the angel says, here is the mind with wisdom, which has wisdom. The point here is he goes, this is a riddle. This requires some thought. He goes, let me elaborate on this, and it's a riddle. It's a little tricky. Use wisdom here. Apply wisdom. He says, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. 
Now, mountains, in terms of biblical symbolism, represent kingdoms, nations or kingdoms. You look at, for example, the book of Obadiah. The entire prophecy is a prophecy about the mountain of Edom versus Mount Zion. It's about the kingdom of Edom versus the kingdom of Israel, of which Israel prevails ultimately over Edom. The mountain of Edom, that's the language. You'll see, I mean, I didn't pull out the various passages, multiple passages throughout the Old Testament where mountain within apocalyptic symbolism is used to represent a kingdom. So it says the seven heads are seven empires. So you have this beast that has seven heads, which represent seven historical, I would argue, persecuting, satanically empowered kingdoms throughout human history. You go back to the beginning of the biblical narrative. You go, what was the first kingdom that Satan used as a puppet kingdom to try to come against the people of God in this in this ongoing conflict, remember, all the way back to Genesis 3.15, the Lord, as soon as the fall happens in the garden, the Lord looks at the serpent and he says, I'm going to put conflict, enmity between you and the woman, between her descendants and your descendants. History will be defined by a conflict between the righteous seed line and the unrighteous seed line of the serpent. What was the first kingdom that Satan used to try to destroy the people of God. It was Egypt, right? Egypt tried to, you know, destroy the firstborn and, uh, and all of this. So, so you have Egypt and then Assyria and then Babylon is three and then Medo-Persia, number four. Then you had Greece, number five. Then the sixth was Rome. So what's the seventh? This is where the big debate happens, is a lot of people say, well, the seventh is a revival of Rome, a revival of the six. Here's the problem. Let's continue reading. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. So there you go. Kings, kingdoms. I said mountains represent kingdoms. Kings, kingdoms go together, right? They are one. I mean, you can't have one without the other. Then he says, five have fallen. Again, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. At the time of the first century, when the book of Revelation was written, five are gone. One is. What was the one that was? Rome. Rome was the satanic, pagan empire of the day. And he says, the other has not yet come. The other one hasn't even come yet. So it was another pagan if you will, or another religious empire that was coming that worshiped a God other than the God of the Bible. And when he comes, ultimately when it says he, it uses the singular masculine pronoun. Now it's really zeroing in on the Antichrist. When the final one comes, he's going to come for a little while, for a short time. And you see this language throughout the book of Revelation, woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has been cast down, knowing that what? His time is short. He really only has three and a half years. You know, so many Christians, we get in such an uproar, so much panic. I don't want to live during that time. I don't either. I, don't, I didn't want to live through the economic crash of 2008. I didn't want to live through corona. But we did. It's a couple years. We made it. We survived. Three and a half years in the big picture is a short while, a short time to endure. And again, as I always joke, I have such a big mouth. I'm sure I won't make it to the end anyway. I'm sure I'll get beheaded probably in the first few weeks. Because I don't know how to keep my head down and keep my mouth shut. But the point is this. Three and a half years is short. That's the final. In the big picture, that's nothing. We can endure that. And then we, en we enjoy the kingdom forever. So he's going to remain. When the Antichrist comes, he'll remain for a little while. And then it elaborates once again. Verse 11 through 13. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth. Okay, so those who say Rome is the sixth, and then it comes back as the seventh, that's not what the text says. It says there's another one coming. It's the seventh, and then here in verse 11, it tells us the seventh is also an eighth. Okay, okay so the beast that exists, it ceased to exist, 
and then it comes back, it's the seventh and the eighth. It is an empire that comes after Rome, and it has two phases. It has two segments. So it has the historical phase, and then it has the revived phase when it comes back from the abyss for a short time just before the return of Jesus. That is the, the revived kingdom of the Antichrist. It's a revival of one that came previously, that came after Rome. Again, as I said, this is why I believe it's referring to the historical Islamic empire that will be revived. It will come back as the eighth. It's, it's a riddle. It's, again, very mysterious, admittedly. It's one of the seven. And then he goes to destruction. So there's the seven heads. And then he says, the ten horns, which you saw, are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. So they're still future. And they are the ten kings that will comprise the revived kingdom of the Antichrist. Again, the eighth, the final manifestation of satanic pagan empire will be comprised of ten kings. Which, again, we know clearly the Antichrist rises up, supplants three and sort of begins by taking over three. So you can say, including the Antichrist is 11, but ultimately it's repeatedly referred to as 10 kings, 10 kingdoms, 10 nations that will comprise this coming coalition of which the inhabitants of the earth will say, who can make war with the beast? When you get all these 10 together, we can't fight them. They're too powerful. It says, but they will receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. It's not one literal hour. The point is just for a little while. There it is again, a short while, a little while. It's just a brief little period right at the end. They have one purpose, to give their power and their authority to the beast. Verses 14 through 18, these will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who follow him are called the chosen and the faithful. If you are a follower of Jesus watching this, the Lord says you are called faithful. Live up to the name that he's given us. Live up to the name that he's given you. You are faithful. You are not unfaithful. Who you are, who you are called to be, is faithful. And it's a beautiful thing to be faithful. He said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, they're peoples. There it is. I mentioned it earlier. Waters represent, in symbolism, peoples, multitudes, na nations, and different tongues, different languages. And the ten horns which you saw in the beast, these will hate the harlot. Now, here's the big twist. Here's the... M. Night Shyamalan twist at the end of the film. You know, I see dead people. Like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. Because again, we begin with the woman riding the beast. They are one and the same. I make this little joke in my book. I say, you know, picture um, Donna and Merv on their way to go to their bowling league together, because that's what they do. And they have on the same bowling jackets. They're wearing the same uniform. She is the scarlet prostitute riding the scarlet beast. They're both wearing the same uniform. They're in partnership. This is the Lone Ranger in silver. They are a team. And then all of a sudden it says this, the beast is, the beast is this coalition of 10 kings. And it says the 10 kings will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her up with fire because God will put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and they are giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. So this is one of these passages where, you know, you'll often get people, they get in arguments over strange things. They'll be like, that's the wrath of Satan, not the wrath of God. I go, yeah. Like, yeah, you can say that, but God is sovereign. Like, guys, I hate to say it, but Satan is God's Satan. There's nothing Satan can do without God's permission. God is in control of everything. You know, as the old preacher sometimes uh, would joke, God and the devil are after me. I sometimes feel that way. 
God and the devil are after me. Which is it? Is it God or is it Satan? Should I fight against it or should I submit to it? Here, you have God putting his purposes into the hearts of these satanically empowered kings to fulfill his purposes. The Lord is always a thousand steps ahead of Satan. Satan's like, yeah, you, you, Satan is insane, and I've said this before. Well, if Satan knows God's going to do this, why does he try to do it anyway? Because he's crazy. He's brilliant. He's an absolute genius. He understands Bible prophecy far better than you and I. But he's insane. And God will put it in his mind, the things necessary to fulfill his purposes. God is always a thousand steps ahead of all of us, including the devil. And then there it is again. The woman whom you saw is the great city who reigns over the kings of the earth. So we've already seen that she is the great false religion. She's the greatest false religion, the greatest source of the bloodshed of the saints throughout the earth. And here she's called the great city. Now, throughout the prophecy, she is called a city eight times. She's called the great city, which we'll see, six times. And she is described in ways that can only apply to a literal geographic city. Now, this crazy picture with all of its symbolism, prostitute, a cup full of filth and blood of the saints and a beast with horns and heads and crowns and yada, yada, yada. It's a lot of sim symbolism. It is all a metaphor. It is a symbolic picture which represents something very real. I'm going to wrap up this session here and we're going to come back next week, jump back into 18 and continue. This prophecy, as I said, think about this. It is the longest prophecy in the New Testament. It's one of the longest prophecies in the Bible, but there's some pretty long ones in some of the prophets, obviously. It is the longest prophecy in the New Testament. It makes up some, again, chapters 17, 18, and then the first, I believe, six verses in chapter 19. It might be the first five verses. Um, so six, 17, 18, and part of 19. It makes up two plus of the final chapters in the book of Revelation and the final chapters of the entire Bible. When is the last time that any of you heard a preacher on Sunday teach about anything in these chapters? Like, you will never hear a pastor give sermons on this. But what this represents is a very real geopolitical entity, a city. Okay, the metaphor is the harlot, but it represents a very real city that we can point to. We can hop on a plane and travel to. If you are living in the last days, this is a very real and profoundly influential religious capital, a capital of false religion, a capital of idolatry. Now, what you'll have is, as people try to interpret these things, and these, forgive me, I don't mean to be in any way condescending, but it drives me crazy when people go, well, the city represents. They'll start talking about what the city, well, the city represents the unclean thought processes of the greater, you know, like whatever concept. And I go, no, the woman is the metaphor. The woman is the symbol. What she represents is the city, which is literal. That is reality. City is not, the city is not a metaphor. It's not a metaphor within a metaphor. Well, the woman represents a city, but the city represents, no, it, the angel tells us what it means. This is a identifiable, real city in the earth. It is the hub. It is the fountain. It is the womb, the primary source, the fountainhead of persecution against the saints and against the witnesses of Jesus in the earth in the last days. Like, that is very relevant. This is not just weird apocalyptic trivia. If we are living in the last days, then understanding these chapters, understanding this prophecy, will help us to identify the locus, the, the hinge, the, again, the fountain, 
of Christian persecution throughout the earth, like the primary source of hatred, of satanic hatred for Christians in the last days under the Antichrist. Understanding this prophecy is critical. And as I said, you'd never hear pastors preach about it. I'd say this is really important information. I'd say understanding. I'd say taking some time to discuss these things is relevant. It's not just weird, fringy, end-time trivia. Understanding these things can actually help us to understand the world that we live in right now, if indeed we are living in these last days, which I believe we are. She is the great city. And it goes on, and it describes her in ways that can only um, be applied to a literal city. You know, she does commerce with the kings of the earth. When she's destroyed, the kings of the earth weep and lament and this type of thing. So I think we're about, um, we've about run out of time for this session. I'm going to wrap it up right here. We've read all of chapter 17 in next week's session. We're going to pick up with chapter 18, continue teasing out some of the biblical criteria to understand this woman. And then we're going to jump into some of the different interpretations, theories. And what we'll do probably is take a session for each of them. Some people believe the woman represents the United States or New York City or Washington. Some people believe the woman represents, as I said, Jerusalem. Many others are convinced it's Rome. Some people believe it's referring to literal Babylon in Iraq, that it will be rebuilt. Others believe it's conceptual. It's just talking about uh, Christianity, apostate Christianity, liberal Christianity. Others believe it's slightly conceptual, like the UN or you know, this type of thing. Like, there's a lot of different theories. So we're going to take a session for each of these and discuss the strengths and the weaknesses, the good arguments, the bad arguments, and then we will offer my interpretation. I'll offer my interpretation. Again, something I'm not dogmatic about by any means, but it's um, the interpretation that I offer in my book, Mystery Babylon. And we're actually going to take a couple sessions to discuss some other relevant matters that relate to this prophecy, ideas that greatly impact the, the mindset of many believers today, um, particularly, as I said, sort of in the Hebrew Roots movement or in some of these more, um, and, and when I say fringe, I just mean on the peripheral. I don't mean it in a negative way, but some of the movements that are, are really given to prophecy and these type of things. So we'll take some time to um, discuss some of these very relevant uh, topics, but we're going to end that. We're going to end this right here. So Again, guys, I hope this was a good, helpful introduction. Look forward to jumping into it a bit more with you next week. Have a blessed and fantastic week. And until then, Maranatha.